Hi guys. Um, so I'm back for a lecture about the second part of chapter five. So this is more about soil water, um, thinking about soil water from the soil energy, soil water energy perspective. Um, but now that we understand the basic of water potentials, which we talked about last time, this part is going to be more about how water flows and then um, where we have water in the soil. So water content based on kind of our past understanding about how water would move around. So I'm going to share my screen again so you can see the slides. Okay, let's get the slideshow going. Okay, so um, before we talked about water potentials, so hopefully you remember that there's these about four different um, potentials that affect the soil um, potential soil water potential movement. So those are gravity. Gravity has the potential to move water. Um, soil matrix particles. So the solid particles that can bond onto the water have the potential to attract um, water and pull water in one way. Um, soil solutes. Um, the dissolved salts and sugars and other things in the in the soil have the potential to grab and pull water. Um, and then the soil, the other water molecules themselves have the ability to push on the water, which is called the hydrostatic or pressure potential. So these are the things that are pushing and pulling water around in the soil. And so now we kind of want to think about um, when we would have one or the other of these water potentials kind of dominating the movement of water. So the first case happens when the soil is saturated. So hopefully you'll remember that means that that is when all the pore spaces inside the water are completely filled with water, so there's no space for air. And when that happens, the gravitational potential is really important. So at this point, all the soil matrix um, are completely coated with water, right? Water is bonded to all the soil solid surfaces, so there's no really extra surfaces to bond with water. Um, so this downward pull of gravity is going to be really affecting water moving through pore spaces. And then also because there's so many water molecules crowded together, they have the potential to really be pushing on each other. So those are the two um, potentials that dominate in saturated um, environments. On the other hand, above the water table in the unsaturated zone, um, which is also called the Vado zone, we have areas where the soil particles um, are spaced out like always. There's pore spaces in between them, as you can see in this diagram. Uh, and some of those pore spaces are filled with water, but some of the spaces are filled with air. So that's what an unsaturated soil looks like. That's above the water table, which is the point of contact between the saturated and unsaturated zone. And in this case, the soil surfaces have a really dominating influence on pulling and attracting um, water as it moves around in the soil. And so as we've discussed, this might cause water to not only be moving down, but to also be maybe moving sideways or even back upwards through the soil. Um, however, it's also important to understand that um, air pockets and whatnot in the soil can definitely interrupt the, the flow of that kind of capillary movement that we talked about um, in um, the last PowerPoint. Okay, so um, once water gets into the soil, um, we can think about how it moves around, but before it even gets into so the soil, it has to um, perform what we call infiltration. So infiltration is the movement of soil from the surface um, actually into the soil medium itself. And so sometimes there might be things that prevent that from happening. When we've talked a little bit about that in the case of erosion and compaction and whatnot before. Um, but one thing that we haven't talked a lot about yet is that the way the storm um, occurs and then also the stage of the storm might influence whether water that's falling from the sky can infiltrate the soil or not. So we did kind of mention in the case of the universal soil loss equation that not all rainfall is the same. Rainfall that's really intense with a big burst of water all at once might be more difficult for the soil to handle than kind of gradual, soft, continued rainfall. But even within a storm, usually what we'll see is in the very first part of the rain, 
or snow that falls down to the ground. Um, the vegetation over the surface, so that might be trees up above the ground or bushes or grass or things like that closer to, to the ground, they will actually intercept or capture the moisture. And so it will get caught on leaves or blades of grass and it won't actually make it down to the ground at all. That's called interception. And then as the storm continues, the kind of capacity for plants to hold on to the moisture is overwhelmed. And so the water starts to make it down to the soil surface and it starts to infiltrate into the soil. Um, and then at some point, the soil's ability to infiltrate will be overwhelmed. And at that point, then we start to see the surface runoff. So this graph on the slide here is kind of showing us that, um, it depends on how long it's been raining, um, kind of what capacity any environment will have to potentially in intercept all the water or intercept some and infiltrate most of the water or infiltrate some and have some surface runoff or almost lose all water to surface runoff. So usually the longer the storm is, the more the water will be lost to surface runoff. However, we've also talked about before that the structure of the soil is really important in determining how well poised that soil may be to infiltrate water. So we talked about that when we um, talked about good soil management and best management practices and we heard from people like Gabe Brown and he said that his management on his property has increased his soil inf infiltration dramatically compared to his neighbors. So he ends up being able to store much more water on his property than his neighbors nearby, which then of course he can use to support plant growth later on. So we've already um, identified things like aggregation of soils, um, creating big macropore spaces um, as important um, sources of infiltration capacity. And we've mentioned things like OM or organic matter, and then flocculation through things like calcium or these um, polyvalent cations as um, sources that might allow better um, aggregates to form. On the flip side, we said soil compaction um, that might be caused by driving or plowing over time could be problematic, could limit um, the ability for, to soil for soil to infiltrate. And then another thing that we'll talk a little bit more about later when we talk about um, heat and fire is uh, something that's called hydrophobicity. So what that means is hydro water phobic is, a, you know, phobia is being scared of something. So sometimes we have soil that acts in a way that it actually repels water and water beads up on the surface rather than being able to infiltrate down into the soil. And this is usually when essentially there's like grease different kinds of um, hydrocarbon um, compounds that kind of coat the surface of the soil. And this a lot of times happens after forest fires um, when organic matter will burn in the fire and then it will get so hot that it will volatilize or basically become little carbon gases. And then as the air cools down, that carbon coats the surface of the soil and makes it this like greasy film that then water has a hard time infiltrating. So then after forest fires, we a lot of times have these big flood events um, where lots of water is rushing down hill slopes all at once because it can't get into the soil. So that's something that we'll talk more about later. Okay, so then once the water gets into the soil, the percolation is actually a separate term that refers to the movement of water inside the soil. And so water, um, as we said, might be moving down, but also could be like moving back up or sideways, depending on the potentials um, that are occurring there. But one thing that's um, interesting to note is sometimes we have what are called perched water tables in the soil. And this happens when water starts to kind of drain down through the soil, percolate into the soil, and then it hits some layer that kind of prevents the soil from continuing to drain farther down. And that might be kind of just in a little isolated zone that's above kind of the major um, bedrock that's below most of the soil in that region. And sometimes it might be an impervious layer, really hard pan, a really cemented zone that water can't get through because there's just physically not enough space for the water to move into. But interestingly, sometimes um, there might actually be a situation where a gravel layer below the soil would actually act as a, to create a 
perched water table as well. And that's because as water moves down through the soil, there's a lot more matrix, soil matrix, a lot more surface area in say like a loamy soil or a clay soil above the gravel layer. And so as water starts to hit that gravel clay boundary, it ends up staying stuck to the clay and doesn't really move down into the gravel. Um, and so you can kind of see from this diagram on the bottom right that we might have plants that are kind of taking advantage um, of some sort of um, perched water table that's created by a difference in soil texture um, within a particular region. Okay, so then um, once we have water in the soil, we are gonna wanna measure the soil water content. So this is what you guys are doing for lab this week. And so basically we can either report the soil water content by volume, what's the space that the water in the soil would take up, or we can report it based on gravity, or um, basically we can measure its weight um, or its mass um, and think about how much does the water that's in the soil weigh. And so in both cases, these are reported as percents um, where we can say, there's a certain volume of water relative to a certain volume of soil area or soil volume that's taken up, a space that's taken up by water compared to a space that's taken up by whole soil, um, and then reported as a percent, so maybe 25% water. Um, or we can report it as the mass of the water in the soil compared to the mass of the soil solids not including the water. So just the, the mass of the solid soil materials. Um, and in both cases, the units that were um, the dominate, denominator and the numerator units are the same. We end up with a kind of percentage type value. And this is what you guys are gonna do in lab. So there's instructions and stuff in the lab. So I'm not gonna belabor this here, but basically there's two different ways that you might hear people reporting about soil water content. Um, another way that you might hear people talking about soil water content is um, in kind of thinking, describing the soil water content in how it kind of affects plant growth. And so in this case, there's these kind of four different stages that a soil can be in. And the first stage is called a saturation. So we've already discussed what this would look like. This is when all the pore spaces in the water are filled up or all the pore spaces in the soil are filled up with water, and you have to basically have a continuing new water source to maintain saturation over long periods of time. And then we've mentioned before that when the soil is saturated, usually it's a gravitational potential, also maybe some hydrostatic potential that might influence um, any water movement. And at this point, the, the soil would have a water potential of zero. Okay. So then the next case is something that's called field capacity. And this is basically the stage of soil water that you would wanna maintain if you're growing plants. And this would have a slightly negative water potential, okay? So if you had a saturated soil next to a field capacity soil, the water moves down gradient, as we talked about last um, lecture, from zero to the negative pressure value, so it would move into the field capacity zone where there's a little bit less water. And in this case, the matrix forces, the bonds between the water and the soil um, are causing a lot of water to be held in place. Um, so at this point, the soil solids are basically holding as much water as they possibly can against the force of gravity. So some water will have drained out of the soil because of gravity, but a lot of the other water is held there by the soil surfaces. And then there's a little bit of capillary movement around within the soil profile. And this is kind of ideal for plants. There's some air getting in there that plants need. They need oxygen, they need water um, gas exchange, um, but they should have plenty of water that they need to get into their roots. Um, then there's another stage that's called wilting point. And at this point, um, there's still some water in the soil. It's not completely gone. But at this point, the soil solids have such a solid or strong hold on any 
um, water that's left or some solutes, some salts or other things that might be in the soil water have such a strong hold on any water that's left that it's pretty much impossible for plants to be able to capture water from the soil. And so as a result, they start to wilt. Um, so at this point, this soil would have an even more negative water potential, in this case shown as like a negative 1500 kilopascals at KPA is a pressure unit. And so again, if you had a field capacity soil next to a wilting point soil, the water would be moving through capillary movement away from the field capacity soil towards the more negative wilting point where the soil particles would have a stronger grab or, um, or a stronger ability to attract and, and bond with any water that's there. And then the final stage is called hydroscopic soil, um, not hydroscopic, which you might think because it's about water. Um, but this is basically like an extreme soil water loss condition where, again, there's actually probably some water molecules still in the soil. But at this point, they are so um, strongly bonded to, you know, some kind of internal clay surfaces and whatnot that they're completely really unavailable for organisms. Um, and this would occur after a long extended period of evaporation with no um, water contact. So a lot of times people use the analogy for this, um, like if you had a sponge and next time you're doing some dishes, you can spend a moment to try to do this. And basically if you have the sponge kind of running under the water, you can see that the sponge is like totally filled up and if you keep the faucet on, any water that drips out of the bottom of the sponge is quickly being replaced by water from the faucet. So that's called saturation. Then you could turn the faucet off and hold the sponge there without squeezing it at all. And you could kind of let some of the water drip off through gravity. Um, and after the water stopped dripping off after a few seconds, that sponge would still be holding a whole lot of water that that's all the surface area in this sponge is able to grab onto hold on to. So that would be field capacity, a soil that's holding a whole lot of water. Um, then you could kind of wring out the sponge and you could kind of basically get all the water out of the sponge that you could in that particular moment. Um, and a lot of water would be gone and you could let go of the sponge and there'd be a whole lot less water than they had been at field capacity. And that would kind of be the wilting point. You can't get any more water out, but you know there is still some water in the sponge. It's not totally dried out. And then you could take your sponge and you could put it out on a sunny deck and come back four months later. And you would have a really rock hard, super, super, super dried out sponge. And that would kind of be your hydroscopic sponge. So you can kind of imagine the sponge as acting like a soil because it does really act like a soil. It has all the same surface areas and macropores and micropores that soils do. And that kind of describes how um, the water might be available to plants. Um, so I just have a few graphs that are in the textbook that I want to kind of explain for a few minutes. Um, and so what this shows is soil water content on the vertical axis, okay, reported as a percent, and this is a volumetric water content. And then a soil um, moisture potential along the bottom, okay, so we know zero is a very kind of the, one of the higher water potentials that you're gonna have, and then your water potentials are gonna get more and more and more negative. Okay, and then you can kind of see how um, you might have a soil when it's completely saturated that has 50% or more of the volume of that soil filled up by water. That's kind of where this blue line is hitting the Y or the vertical axis, okay? And then as that um, water starts to drain out, that first amount of water is the gravitational water that's lost. And so you can see that in the gray area on the right, that top water is called gravitational water. And after that gravitational water drains, you might have a uh, soil water content that's closer to like 40%. And at that point, your soil moisture potential is getting lower, maybe around negative 10. So again, if you had a saturated 
area and a field capacity area nearby, the water would move from the saturated zone to the field capacity zone. And then if you were at um, the wilting point or what's called the wilting coefficient um, area, you might have a little bit less than 10% um, soil water content and you would have a much, much more negative soil water potential. And then you can see that water that's kind of in the gray bar on the right shown in between field capacity and the wilting coefficient is what's kind of the available, the plant available water. So that, and the first water is rapidly available. The last water in that zone is slowly available. That's kind of all the capillary water movement. And then we have this hydroscopic water that's a little bit less water by volume and also a little bit of a even lower water potential. And then below that, there is some water that's probably still in the soil, but it would be completely unavailable to plants. So this is kind of another way to visualize um, what that means. Okay, and then here's one more um, kind of set of diagrams from the textbook. Um, so again, showing these different water potentials getting more and more negative as the soil is drying out more and more. And then showing saturated field capacity and wilting point where we can see the water is still in the soil at the wilting point, but it's bonded very tightly onto soil particles at that point. And there's not a lot that's able to really move through the macropore and mesopore spaces. Um, and then you could also look at these different kind of amounts of soil solid and then soil water versus soil air um, in these different stages of um, saturation, field capacity, wilting point, and hydroscopic um, point where there's less and less water and more and more air as the soil dries out. And then finally, there's a diagram here that I think is interesting that shows along the bottom axis different kinds of soil in terms of different soil textures. So sandy soils versus loamy soils versus silty or clay-like soils. And then it basically shows how at different water contents, the soil actually might be at a different water point from a plant perspective. So for instance, a sandy soil that has um, only like 8% um, water um, by volume in it might be at field capacity, okay? Um, whereas a clay-like soil um, might have as much as 32% um, water in it, and it would also just kind of be hitting that field capacity line. So that field capacity line being that kind of dark blue line in between the white area above. And so basically what this is showing us is because clay is so much better at grabbing and holding water than sand, that plants are gonna have a different ability to capture water away from clay soil, from a clay soil matrix as opposed to a sandy soil matrix, right? The clay is gonna be able to hold it better longer whereas the sand is going to not be able to hold the water very well at all. So this is going to um, influence whether and when the um, soil can be captured by plants easily. So it's not exactly a picture that's the same for every different soil texture. Um, okay, I think that's it. So um, I will post this for you guys to look at and um, please contact me with questions. All right, take care.